We got full bellies now, the lights are getting dim, so don't fall asleep on me. But uh, my name is Tim Sigmund. I work for Texas Parks and Wildlife. You have to forgive my voice, I've been fighting a sinus infection for about a week. <laughs> but today we're going to talk about a program that I'm a, a big part of. And here over the last six years, times I've been working with Parks and Wildlife, it's called Pastures for Upland Birds. Uh, primarily what we do is focus on converting Bermuda and McGee grass pastures and other uh, non-native exotic pasture grasses back to a more uh, perennial prairie type system. We don't have quite the diversity some of these public lands or some of these NGO lands have, but we're trying to build that structure for upland birds and for migratory songbirds as well. So we're just going to jump right off into it. We're talking about fragmentation here, and I'm not talking about fragmentation of habitat, but also <coughs> fragmentation of land holdings. It makes it difficult on two levels. One, from a species level, they need certain size patches in order to function. So on here I put 3,500 to 7,000 acres for quail to be effective for population size. Anybody who just listened to Lenny's talk a little while ago, he kind of blew that out of the water with this 200,000 acre number from a genetic side of things. But we're, our average land ownership in my area for most of the counties is somewhere around 120 to 160 acres. So it takes quite a few properties to work up to that size. So, and we know it's getting worse. So since from 97 to 2012, according to the Institute of Renewable Natural Resources of A&M, the Texas population went up by about 36%. 87% of that growth happened in the 25 fastest growing counties. Now why does that matter? Is most of those 25 fastest growing counties are in the Blackland Prairie and the Coastal Prairie ecoregions, right? So we're losing these grasslands at an accelerated rate relative to the rest of Texas. So total land conversion in those 25 fastest growing counties was about 54%. And then lastly, there was actually an increase in the number of farming and ranching operations. So we have smaller farms on a shrinking land base, which usually leads to more <coughs> intensive agricultural use to try to generate a profit, less room for wildlife. So here's another graph from them showing increase in 100, 1 to 100 acre farms over that 15 year period by about almost 26,000 number of farms and a loss on our mid-range farms, 100 to 500 acres, 500 to 1,000, 1,000 to 2,000 acres. And there's been a slight accumulation of 2,000 plus acre properties. So that's a good thing, that not so much. Of course, that's probably well over me if I ever have been owning any land. So maybe I can get one of those 26,000, I guess. <laughs> but uh, pretty much if you're doing any work east of I-35 and north of I-10 in Texas, which if you looked at any of the breed bird maps where the quail have gone away for the most part in Texas, you're working with farms less than 500 acres in size. The light green is 25 to 50% of the farms in that county are less than that size. The little darker green is 50 to 75%. So working with smaller land holdings that aren't gonna be able to support large populations. Showing farms that are greater than 2,000 acres in the proportion of county. Obviously South Texas and West Texas have a higher proportion of farms of that size. And this is where land conversion, the rate of conversion is the highest. So you can see you got Denton, Collin, Dallas, and Tarrant counties, Harris, Fort Bend, I think it's Montgomery County, Travis, Williamson, Bell, Bear, and some of the others in those areas. And the areas we're focusing in here is right in through there, through the Blackwood Prairies and the Post Oak Savannah. So at the same time, though, that land conversion is going on, things are going, <coughs> getting chopped up. On a continental scale, these grassland birds, which we talked about over and over again at this conference, are declining over the long term as well. So, Larhead Shrike, Northern Bob White, showing from 66 to 2000, <coughs> steady decrease over time. And the 2000 number is important here, because <coughs> this was taken, <coughs> excuse me, that's about the time the Pasture for Upland Birds program started. So what they were trying to do is address the realities of what they were seeing on the ground. At this time, within Parks and Wildlife, there really was no programmatic funding to help restore these habitats within our ecosystem. They realized they needed to incentivize conservation, but our only tools at that time were pretty much getting funding through NRCS, which went up against other countywide uh, projects for funding basis, or statewide programs like LIP, which would be ranked based on what the, the focus was for that year. So it made it difficult to try to get any funding for some of these restoration efforts. So knowing this, and knowing we also had small land ownerships, they tried to build up wildlife cooperatives or uh, close working groups to build up one interest two, the expertise, three, have the tools to do it, pool the manpower to pull off the projects, and also the other resources necessary to do the different things. So this is District 5, it's the area I work in. So there's Dallas, 
You got Tyler over here, College Station down at the bottom, Waco somewhere in there. My focus area is these seven counties. Those are my areas of responsibility that I primarily work in. And the Pastors for uh, Upland Birch Program, that's its primary focus area. We work a little bit outside of there, but that's generally where most of the funding goes to and where we try to run our projects. So in 2001, <clears throat> folks from Texas AgriLife Extension Service, Parks and Wildlife with Matt Wagner, generated enough interest and were able to pull some money together to put together a four-year study on some sites in Grimes, Falls, and Lee counties. <clears throat> what they did is they had a control plot, and then they had an application rate of Glyphomax Plus, which is a, a glyphosate-based herbicide, at four and six quarts per acre to eliminate Bermuda and Bahia grass on these pastures and try to restore them. <clears throat> they did this on clay, sandy, and sandy loam soils. Excuse me. So the biggest thing they were trying to do at that time was they wanted to determine a strategy to one, eliminate the exotic perennial grasses, and two, then establish the native grasses effectively, while at the same time providing technical assistance and cost sharing incentives to private landowners to do so. I thought I was out of time. No, <laughs> so establish a demonstration site throughout the post oak and black lane savannah and other regions as well to get landowners to even see this. This land has been so converted that when I try to talk about native grasses, if I ask them what's Bermuda grass, everybody can raise their hand. If I ask them what's little blue stem, nobody knows. Those sorts of things. It's just out of the consciousness of what it is. So we're trying to even build the basis for the knowledge. So what they did is they partnered up and the landowners provided the cost for the seed. Uh, we had about 300 gallons of the Glyphomax herbicide donated by the Iowa scientists, about $12,000 for the retail donation. $10,000 was donated by each by the Quail Unlimited Cross Timbers chapter and the <coughs> NIFWIF funding to purchase the native grass seed drill from Truax. And then a trailer, a Donahue drop trailer was donated by National Wild Turkey Federation. So all together we had a little over, <coughs> excuse me, $32,000, $40,000 worth of funding to get the project off the ground get the initial equipment. And they had some success here in Lee County. You see he's got a bunch of uh, switchgrass and other things. The problem was a lot of these projects were really small and there wasn't a lot of follow up with them afterwards. So some of them were as small as three acres, the bigger ones were up around 20, 25 acres. Uh, it was kept it rolling with approximately $9,000 additional dollars in equip funds, which helped for uh, additional uh, um, research put on by Brian Hayes and Neil Wilkins and local county agents and there those 15 demonstration sites between 2001 and 2003. So from there, you can see there's the Bermuda grass after it was sprayed, and then a few years later, uh, you got Indian grass here in the foreground and a couple other things. At that time, they were doing a pretty low diversity mixture, and by most people's standards, we still are. Uh, I think they were only doing six to eight species then, now we're up to about 18, but still pretty low diversity. When you talk to some of the folks in Nebraska and Missouri and things like that who were doing 60, and they're doing 60 species, and I think that's low diversity. A lot of times I do 100 plus. So those are pretty awesome, uh, get pretty expensive. <laughs> so now the process has evolved. Uh, we're annually funded. We're not looking for continual funding to keep these things going. The program had kind of waned after Matt moved on. We were doing one to two projects a year. Uh, and then we had another guy move on, and I kind of, I guess, took up the banner, for lack of a better term, and started pushing these prog uh, programs forward and getting more interest both from within our own uh, district and outside as well to get funding. So it's an annual budget allocation from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The Partners for Fish and Wildlife gives us some money to cover the seed cost. Parks and Wildlife covers the uh, herbicide cost and the use of our Truax seed drill and give all the technical guidance they need. Sometimes I meet some folks only two or three times on the land. Sometimes I meet them up to six. Depends how much hand-holding they need to get it done. It is a 10-year agreement, so when they sign up, they agree not to convert it to other uses for up to 10 years. It stays within their, their rights. They're not granting anybody else access to it, those sorts of things. But we just want to make sure the money we're spending is staying on the ground for a substantial amount of time. So from 2008 to 2013, roughly, it was uh, Data Prairie Association of Texas was a third party holder of the money and kind of helped us out. In 2014, Fish and Wildlife put it in-house with us, with Parks and Wildlife. And so we're doing everything through our own contracting prices excuse me, contracting process, which has helped us get a better deal on seeds and things like that, or bang for our buck. So like for right now, like I said, we have 18 species on contract through Bamert Seed Company, nine species of grass, nine species of forbs, primarily the climax grass species, uh, obviously the big four, little blue stem, big blue stem, Indian grass, switch grass, eastern gamma grass, sand love grass, 
green sprinkle top and then a handful of others that we have in there, depending on the site. And the forbs are mainly perennial forbs, Maximilian sunflower, Engelman daisy, uh, purple prairie clover, and so on, a couple annuals. So over that time, from 2009 to now, the pub bridge has increased quite a bit. One, because we were spending the money, and two, because seed prices have gone up quite a bit. So initially in 2009, 2010, we were getting about $20,000 a year, and uh, that was going through pretty quick. But at that time, I was doing seed mixes for about $60, $60 an acre. Now a seed mix that would have costed me uh, $60 an acre then runs about $105 to $107. Uh, the drought in 2011, hurt some of the seed sources, but also the increase in demand from some of the wind farm facilities to reseed those areas, and as well as pipelines and uh, pad sites uh, in South Texas and other areas are using natives, kind of increased demand and rose the seed cost quite a bit. So at this time, we were able to do about 300 acres with $20,000. Now we're able to do about, uh, with the same amount of money, 300, 300 acres with about $40,000. Uh, this year we got we made a big jump this fiscal year. We went from thirty five thousand dollars in funding last year to seventy thousand this year, which is a good it's good for me. It gave me a big boost, you know, in the funding, the amount of acres we're able to do, and also a big vote of confidence that they like what we're doing, how we're spending the money. So over the last five years, uh, in fiscal year twenty eleven, two hundred seventy seven acres, and so on down the line. So in the five year total for this program across the area, a little over half of these projects were in my seven counties about 1,608 acres total have been contracted through PUB through those counties. About 950 of those acres were in my seven counties. And those are ones that are just in PUB. So what does that mean? So now we have 1,608 acres spread out across the area. We've got 900 plus additional acres in my seven county area, which sounds like a, a large number to some folks, but if, you know, if you're biologically oriented, we know these are highly separated areas, all those sorts of things. <clears throat> so what does it mean? Well, we know one with these furry systems that size matters. Some of our migratory songbirds can use less than 20 acres, preferably they like 50 acres or more. But we, we're not expecting prairie chickens and bison to show up on 100 acre prairie restorations, right? So that's not what we're really going for. <clears throat> then we know we have lots of problems with these small grasslands, greater likelihood of local extinction, a less diverse plant community, so on. Our management options can be limited because close proximity to houses, roads, other things like that can preclude the use of fire, herbicides, or grazing. And then our cost of management activities are higher per unit area because the grasslands are smaller. But what it does do, you'll see over the following few slides, I think helps a lot in the conversation. So one of the biggest things that I can say is personal experience for the biologists themselves who were implementing these practices. Before PUB, there was no mechanism on a regular basis for parks and wildlife biologists from this region to get funding regularly to build up the expertise necessary to talk to folks. You know, we're talking a lot about soil microbes here today. That's a long stepwise process for people to understand the soil. Usually it takes a couple years to figure it out. First, they gotta figure out how to run the machinery, how to run a uh, seed drill and the different operating parts. Your planning depth, how to do site prep, all those sorts of things. And having this funding to do it regularly builds that and allows us to have the knowledge we come to a private landowner, because this is all on private land, to come forward and speak with confidence and knowledge to give that message to them. Because a lot of times, most of the folks we're working with in our region are coming out of Dallas, Austin, Houston, with a limited background. Some of them have been entirely raised in urban environments, and you have to start from the beginning. So being able to start from the beginning yourself and doing this thing is a huge part of this process, and I think one of the best parts of PUB. The other thing, is it allows the biologist and the private landowner to see the process of the reclamation. So going from a non-native system to bare ground, to seeing those annual plants respond, to seeing the climax plants eventually come through over three to five years is a really big deal. And it helps to further that understanding of those other ecological principles we're talking about, hydrology, soil biology, and so on, connectivity between sites. So they know, okay, I've got a grassland, that's great, but it's only 25 acres, and they realize, hey, I need to talk to my neighbor and get him to do the same thing if I want to get more bang for a buck. And we're seeing that. It starts that conversation within those counties where there's, they don't even know what native grass is when you start. The next thing it's like, oh man, I'll get a phone call and say, hey, I got you know, Indian grass everywhere this year. It's awesome. Or hey, I found some you know, gay feather. You know, uh, one of the, I'd say most excited, got a call from a lady. Uh, she's 82 years old, decided to do the project. She calls me and we talk for 45 minutes about gay feather and Engelman daisy and things like that she's seen on her property, it's, it's pretty neat. When before she was worried about how many cattle she could pound out of production on her farm. 
uh, those sorts of things. And then the other thing it generates, which is really good, is outreach activities, reaching a larger audience beyond the private landowners we're talking to here. So we made this video on a site that we had done, it's grassland restoration for upland birds, and posted it on YouTube. It's been out for a little less than a year, did with AgriLife Extension Service, and we've had 635 views so far. So, so far this year, I've been invited to talk, or I've given talks at talks that I've organized, about eight times about grassland restoration, quail, turkeys, etc. And I've spoken to about 500 people over the course of that time. So this, I went out in one day, made the video, and over the course of the next day and a half, we had it out, and I've reached 635 individuals. So it's a lot of that more passive outreach towards these folks. And um, I'm pretty happy with the video. It's about six minutes long. You type in that search on YouTube, it should pop up, and you'll get to listen to my wonderful narrating voice for six minutes over what's happening there. Uh, some good pictures. And then additionally, with the AgriLife Extension, I'm lucky enough to be office there in College Station, right next to the Wildlife Fishery Science, in the Wildlife Fishery Science Department, Anybody know Jim Cathy with the AgriLife Extension on the wildlife side? Great guy, <coughs> really good at getting out meaningful, well thought out publications. And because we have these sites available, between Jay White's side, who's also a big uh, grassland restorationist in our area, and myself, we were able to provide pictures and expertise to help these things get on further and provide quality information in the forms of these things. I think they printed out close to 2,000 of each of these and gave them out. I personally gave it to the guy who ran the Senate Finance Committee for the Texas Legislature, and I know he gave it to 15 other legislators. So that's something putting that into the consciousness of our elected officials and things like that, about the importance of native grasslands and, and those other things. So that's why those are important, getting that information out to the folks who make decisions that can impact on a statewide basis and regionally. So with that ex combination of experience and exposure put forth by PUB, it's allowed us now, as I'm getting further along into this, I'm starting to get word of mouth projects. In Houston County, I did about a 200 acre project. I had another fellow call me and said, hey, I was driving down the highway. Uh, I know who owned the land. I talked to him, saw all that stuff was out there. Would you mind helping me out? So we're able to go out there and do another project, build, build upon it, those sorts of things. We've developed multi-year projects because we know that funding's gonna be there. It's not a one year and it's gone sort of thing. So we'll do 40 acres this year, 40 acres the next year, 40 acres the next year, and keep on going. And then leveraging funds, we'll look at here in a second, how because Pub was there to get a conversation started, we were able to get $75,000 for an additional project to do almost 400 acres of restoration right next door. So that helps a lot. And like I was saying earlier, familiarity with the methodology and equipment is beneficial. It's like anything, anybody here ever been really good at plants or been in a different part of the world and you know a lot of stuff, and then you're gone for two or three years and you come back like, man, I, I should, know, should know what that is. I used to know how to do that. It's pretty common for me when I went to college in East Texas and did a lot of the trees and shrubs and I go back and I'm like, I know what that is. And you know, it just it doesn't come back for a long time. <laughs> and so if you're only doing a grassland project once every two years, you kind of struggle as you're going through it. If you're doing it on a regular basis and thinking about it all the time, it makes it a lot easier. And then one of the biggest things is sparking interest with money. Uh, I'll have a lot of folks call me who will say, hey, I hear you got this program. They may not have the 20 acres they need to qualify, or they may not want the 10-year agreement. But knowing about the program, they'll call me and we'll talk, and we'll end up doing a project, and they won't get any funding. I've probably done an additional six to 700 acres of projects for the folks who pay for it entirely themselves because they didn't want to get tied down <clears throat> in the contracting process or the 10-year agreement. But PUB was what started the conversation. They knew money was available and may or may not have needed it, but they just wanted some expertise based on that. So that's part of it as well. So here we're talking about leveraging funding uh, and these light circles here. That's what we planted this year, about 105 acres, which was a real struggle with all the rain we had. It happened in about five different spurts. Could we get? I went out to this site right here at one point in March thinking it was dry enough after it hadn't rained in about eight days uh, to see if it was dry enough to plant. I drove out there and about two dozen gluing teal flew off the middle of the deal and I was like, yeah, it's probably too late. <laughs> so uh, so uh, the lot white colored areas are what we'll be planting this next year. And I had this, uh, and what we were gonna do was to do about 60 to 70 acres each year. This whole pro property is about 700 plus acres. And we're gonna do everything that wasn't wooded back to natives and we go into the wooded areas, clear out eastern red cedar, yolk pond, those sorts of things, implement burning, all kinds of good stuff. Well, that was gonna eat up a lot of my pub budget, and I knew it, so I was kind of factoring that in over time. Well, when this first round of Monarch funding came through last year, Partners Fish and Wildlife folks out of Austin had a project fall through. Within two weeks, the money was gonna go away if they didn't get a new one going. 
So I was like, hey, I got one over here in Brazos County that we're gonna do anyways. And so they were able to come over and take a look at it. The landowner was amenable to it. And so we were able to leverage that and get $75,000 of funding to pay for the rest of the project. So I was happy on two fronts. <coughs> one, we were still getting native grass on the ground and a lot of it. Plus we had additional money to do more prairie type restoration and increase our, our diversity of our seed bank. Instead of having 18 species, we're having almost 54 species planted on this property. So a lot better. Uh, the other thing is I got to keep my budget for pub for other projects, which I was happy about. Uh, so I can keep spreading, spreading that knowledge around to different areas. This is another project talking about multi-year projects and just having the equipment and the expertise to go through things. Uh, met with this guy back, I believe it was in 2012 for the first time. <clears throat> See here, yeah, he planted that Northwest Field in 2012. That was the NRCS Equip Program project. And when he planted it, they herbicided it once and they went in with a conventional seed drill to plant it. Now, anybody who has used a conventional seed drill to plant native grass and not a, one with a fluffy seed box knows what happens. What you're gonna do when you try to run it through there? It's gonna clog like, a, like crazy. So he's having to get out about every 30 feet and hit, it, hit the little deals, hit them again, and keep on going. And then it was feeding too fast, actually, when he was doing that. So he had to buy <laughs> double the amount of seed, so very expensive. So the NRCS guys called around, they found out I had a native grass seed drill. And so he called me and I said, yeah, I'll come out and help you out. So he came over here and he, he paid for this firm by itself. We used the native grass seed drill and we started talking. He was like, you sound like you know what you're talking about. Like in the familiarity of methodology and all those kind of things. He was like, can you help me with the rest of these projects? And I was like, sure. And he said, well, I'm going to take a three year break because this cost me a lot of money to do these other two. And so instead of having that three year break, we went ahead and signed him up for the pub program. This one we planted last year. This one we planted this year. This one will be next year. Uh, and he put his own money, lesser, but more money on top of it to increase the diversity within those plantings as well. So now instead of having a 76 acre prairie, uh, our grassland restoration, once all said and done, this will add up to about 200, 205 acres in one big block. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, this past spring for the first time I was out there, and he swears he didn't introduce and I was right here, and in a county where you don't really wouldn't expect to see him, flushed two Bob White quail, which was pretty awesome. That was the first pub project I've been on where I flushed quail in my area, which was pretty neat. Now I've seen a lot more redheaded woodpeckers out there and that stuff and all kinds of things. It's pretty neat to see what's, what's returned in that area. So <clears throat> landowner relationships within all this, the cooperators you work with, they want experience. They don't want to talk to somebody who's like, yeah, I kind of know about wrestling stuff. You should try it, it'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter if it's the, the biologists are talking to experience, as long as they have somebody they can fall back on. There's other biologists within the district who aren't as comfortable with the grassland restoration stuff as I am, since I've done quite a few projects with different folks. So they'll say, hey, you know, this is a good idea, this we should do. I know a guy who can come out and talk to you, and we can kind of build it up, so I'll go out with them. And then it helps them, too. They can learn from me with the landowner as we're going through and doing this stuff. It makes it really, really nice. One well, of the other things, anybody who's from a small town like I am, or think in rural landscapes, people talk a lot about what's going on, right? So failures are spread and accepted sooner than successes. <laughs> so if you try to, if you, if they know, hey, that guy's planting native grass, and it turns out well, they're like, oh, that's cool, that was a fluke. But if they know he's planting and spent a lot of money and it failed, it's like, oh, don't plant natives. That stuff doesn't work, right? <laughs> so it's important to have that that uh, experience and that methodology and the whole process to make it a success makes us, hey, that's what it is. Maybe we can get some of these things going, have other people building upon it instead of being like, that'll never work. So I think Pub has proven itself in what it's built to do. Um, it's not generating a huge landscape of native grassland, but it's doing these things. It's providing demonstration sites to these landowners <clears throat> where they can come take a look at what it is and get familiar with the processes involved with managing and using these native grasslands. It's getting those species on the ground so people can recognize them. Uh, it's an experience builder, not only for the biologist, but for the landowner as well, so they can identify those plants and learn their natural histories. It's providing habitat. We've seen species out there, especially the migratory songbirds and, and species like that using these sites. And one of the biggest things is it provides that mental image of what does it look like after I burn? What does it look like in the first year of restoration? What does it look like after I burn it and then graze it? Those sorts of things. And what provides good habitat instead of these monocultures that we typically see? And so I feel like it really fills a niche between the traditional ag producer who may go to the NRCS or FSA office and the recreational property owner who, while giving at the same time a direct wildlife ecosystem benefit. And I think that's PUB's role. I think it does a good job of doing that, of 
We can help the ag producer, we can help the recreational property owner, and at the same time build their knowledge of all these systems working together. So here's an example. The, the next few slides are not all pub projects, and I'll try to burn through in the next three, four minutes if I don't run over time. But this was a site where he had planted native grasses previously, and had come back in, and everything here on the left, that's bahia grass, really, really thick. And it filled in everything. So what we came in and did <clears throat> was that spring, we came in with Cimarron Plus and applied the 44 ounces an acre, and we replaced that structure right there, and we got the structure we wanted, this little blue stem there in the background, switch grass clumps here, and the only difference, you can see that application line of that Cimarron, and what it did to that bahia grass. That also eliminated a lot of the broadleaf things that first year, but the next year, <clears throat> which I just couldn't find the picture, it didn't order well, I guess, but there's black-eyed Susans, bee balm, all your legumes, they were all back. They were hidden in that seed bank beneath all that bahia grass. And that cost him about $3 an acre. So instead of having to do the $150 to $200 uh, dollar complete restoration to get rid of that stuff, we just applied that herbicide. And that again is that knowledge of knowing the herbicides, having the experience, knowing what to use. We did that. For $3 an acre, he got a lot of the things back that we wanted. So these next couple <coughs> are additional projects. Some are pub projects, some aren't. Again, I feel like pubs started the conversation with these folks. <coughs> this one is, if you have ever been in the post oak savannah of Texas, this should be a familiar theme for one that hasn't been burned or disturbed for a long period of time. Yeah. February of 2010, that's all Yopon, just a thicket, about 100 acres of it. So this was in the restoration area for the Houston Toad. So we were able to get some fish and wildlife funds to go in and use a brush mulcher. This is a Barco brush mulcher. It's got 64 carbide teeth on that rotating drum. Goes in there and eats it up real good. So went in there and ate it all up. And that's the same picture <coughs> from there to there. Uh, after about, they ended up doing about 15 acres all together on this first go round. Ate it up real good, but we know what? If you eat it up, what's gonna happen to that yopon in three or four months? It's gonna come right back up, right? So here's a picture from four months later. See all that brown? That's where a very dedicated landowner, and again, this is known your landowner, went through and spot sprayed. All the little Yopon reese process that came up with Remedy. It worked really well. But now we've got usable space. As soon as he did that, we started seeing owls. Some of your woodland hawks were in there a lot thicker, things like that. Before that, it was completely unusable. Uh, good regrowth, uh, poke, poke salad, poke weed. American Beauty Berry, Green Bar, all kinds of deer food in there, those sorts of things. It's, they could actually use the property and see it. Before, you couldn't see from here to the wall. Now you can see 75 to 125 yards through the woods. So we planted at the same time. He went through and broadcasted the native grass through that area. I don't have a picture from 2011 of this site. I do on the next one. So about two years later, same spot, looking at a different thing. Yellow Indian grass, lots of sand, love grass. Uh, cytoscroma, things like that, within that matrix, providing much better habitat, much more useful for herbs, small mammals, all sorts of things in that, in that environment. Same site, <clears throat> different area. So you can see, this is four months later, you can see the little native grass seedlings coming up after some good rain. Further back, that was where the first picture was taken. This is July of 2010. Next picture is July of 2011. And I went out there and checked this spot out. And you can see there's one sad little clump of native grass right there. And you can see how sad all this beauty berry looks with the hanging leaves right in the height of that drought. And we went out there and I walked to that back portion and there was nothing up. And I was like, oh man, I just made this man waste a lot of money. You know, so I wasn't, wasn't, wasn't too happy. But then lo and behold, it starts to rain the next year. And that's the next September. Wow. Uh, we got Maximilian sunflower. Uh, again, sand love grass. There was Indian grass in there, eight foot tall. It was great. And actually right after it, that's my nephew. Right after that picture was taken, he walked back up there and jumped two fawns out of there. And I was like, well, I wish I'd gotten a picture or video of that. It'd been like one of those deals like, Tim's a great biologist. You know, you come <laughs> <through here." laughs> so it worked out really well. It's a Robertson County property. What had happened here was a, a power line right away had come through, and they had run, they put in new poles. A lot of equipment going back and forth on this one site, torn it all up. I mean, just all the heck. And the soil was, it's these loose, real loose, deep uh, sands in the Carrizo Formation, and they wash really bad when it rains, if you get really heavy rain events like we tend to get. Uh, and so he wanted to put something on there, so we decided to put native grass on there. It's a grass-only mix. So March 14th was the day we were out there to plant. This is August of that same year, so roughly, what is that, five months, four or five months? 
uh, and that's big blue stem flowering in the first year, which anybody just loves. That's pretty, for in my experience anyways, it, having it flower the first year isn't all that common. And we got a three inch rain in July, and I think that's why. So we've got good rows. You can see the rows coming down there as we go. You can see right there the rows going down from the native grass seed drill. October, the same year, two months later. And that's pretty phenomenal for first year growth in my area. Uh, see lots of cytosperma seeding out. Here's some little blue stem there. Some of the croton that's taking up that site, those sorts of things. And we're actually supposed to burn this site this year. We're hoping we can use some of these native grass fuels to rush into that uh, yopon deal, start making some headway into that yopon and start thinning it out as well. This is the Houston County property we were talking about. This is my, one of my first visits out there. He had planted this in May of 2013. This is where I was talking about the experience. Uh, he had planted it in May, so this is two months later. And that is just a sea of crow, all right? Uh, so what, what would y'all do if y'all saw that? Who would say I'd shred it? Anybody? Anybody shred that? Sure. I'm sure. thinking he would spray 2,4-D over the top of it and get rid of that broad leaf and release all those native grasses we planted. He can mow it. He can mow it. You can do all those strips. Mow it. I'd mow strips. Exactly. So those are all things he could do. But I know one, knowing the landowner's objectives, he's just interested in wildlife. This isn't for grazing. This isn't for anything else. And knowing the ecology of these grasses, and I've seen this before, they're gonna be fine, they're just sitting there. So I decided, I was like, let's not do anything. It's going to, it'll just come up, it'll be great dove hunting for you during the second, second season, just let it go. So we let it go. In June of the next year, you never even know there was that crop of stuff out there. He did nothing. And that's what it looks like in June following year. There's Indian grass out there, a little blue stem, that's only a year after planting. This is a picture from this April. See the structure starting to get there after the second growing season. And this was just a few weeks ago in September. You can start seeing a lot more of those climax grass. Lots of Indian grass out there. This side heavily dominated with Indian grass. Cliff, you were this is where the field we were walking in. That yeah, it's fantastic. So it, it turned out really well. <clears throat> so building on those other ecological principles is like, okay, now we got this native grass. And saying, I really like this. You know, we're starting to get these wildlife. Three, four years down the road, it starts to get a lot of that uh, buildup of thatch and other things. And they're like, you know, maybe this does need a fire. Those sort of things. So. This is a burn we did on some of these Brazos County properties. <coughs> you can see the switchgrass there, planted from an old one's Alamo. But just this is going to show some of the, so it, talking about the, the image to build to show these people, I've now been able to use these images to show, again, close to four or 500 people what it looks like as we progress through a burn after we get these burns done. So that was February 26th we did the burn, that's March 18th, March 31st, April 16th, April 23rd, May 3rd, May 20th. Those time progression things really help folks see what happens and how it changes over time. So here's another spot. You can see here's that switchgrass in full ignition mode right there, you know, 12 foot burn lengths. So we're going to be looking from this way back at that uh, cedar tree right there. So you can see that's the, where it got a little browned out from that fire. So again, March 18th, March 3rd, 1st, April 16th, April 23rd. So uh, by April 23rd, roughly two months later, that's a yard stick. It's already come back up almost three feet. So you show how much produ production you have that quickly. May 3rd, May 20th, Mr. Wakefield there is about six foot five to give you an idea of how tall that grass has already grown in just about <clears throat> three months. That was October 12th once it seeded out. So it's a little over seven and a half, eight feet tall. Another side of blue stem, same property. April 23rd, it's only up about 14 inches. May 20th, you can see the structure, the little blue stem bunches coming back. May 20th, you got some meadow pink, partridge pea coming up, lots of little sedges in here. May June 22nd, partridge pea all over the place, really getting good structure. And I then also you can see these are the impacts of a drought once it doesn't rain for three months. You know, all the blue stem goes that dry. And then it turns, we got 12 inches of rain now over since October 12th. <laughs> so from flood to drought, back to flood. The other thing is showing them when we do these things, in this little middle square plot right here, I counted 18 different species of plants. A lot of annual plants, a lot of milkweed, a lot of native grasses, those sorts of things. Showing the diversity you have in these grasslands is something that building those ecological principles and what they're thinking about to get it going. Mm -hmm. You get some carpenter bees using some of the green milkweed. Yeah. Just a ton of milkweed respond to this. A lot of the dicanthelium grass in the surrounding area, all that sort of stuff producing seed. Providing that structure that you really want in the early spring, 
and then moving forward into the midsummer so you get that nesting habitat and those runways that you're looking for. Never mind that ryegrass right there. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I'll open up for questions. I guess we got about six minutes. I don't know what went over, but. Yeah. So, you know, sorry. <laughs>